I think the key thing um, is to look at it like you would any patch. You know, you've effectively got a patch online, and you've just got to look at it in the same way. And you've got to structure who are in your network um, as best you can to get the best information you can and the quickest information. So, say for example, if you're working as a local journalist somewhere, you'd be looking at all of the major police forces, all of the ambulance forces, all of the major politicians, any activists in the area, all the other journalists, because the key is you want to stay across the opposition. So it's all about actually looking at it the same way you would your patch um, and just casting a net. Um, and a lot of the social networks work in the way that they're echo chambers. So if you miss those initial tweets, for example, um, on a big breaking story, if you're following the right people, it's likely that 10, 20 minutes later, you're going to say to see the same information again, and you can just follow it back to the start and jump on it, stand it up, and then run it yourself. Verifying information with social networks is not easy. Um, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I think you've got to split it into two different things here. Within social networks, there are a lot of official sources that don't need verification. You know, you've got official verified accounts within Twitter. If they run something, it's, it's a police statement, for example, it's a statement from number 10. Um, you can grab that, run with it straight away. The other side of it is all your public. Um, and verifying that kind of information is not easy in the slightest. Um, you could be dealing with anonymous accounts, you could be dealing with people who've got um, pretending to be somebody else, um, and you've got to use all of the skills you've got as a journalist, um, and more effectively, to try and stand that up. Um, you need to try and make contact with these people, first of all. Um, can you speak to them? Is there any other way of verifying it? Is there any other source? Um, and it is really, really hard, and you may get to the stage where actually um, you've done as much as you can. Now, in my opinion, I don't think you should be running information like that unless you've actually stood it up from an official source. Um, you know, we always need to be looking for two sources to try and stand things up like that because if you've got it from, from some member of the public, it could literally be anybody. Um, and if you can't stand it up and you don't know it's true, then don't run it. Um, I think there is a, another aspect which is, which is easier to deal with, which is pictures and video. You know, we get pictures and video in of most breaking news situations um, quicker than any news crew normally gets there um, from members of the public. And these pictures that they've sent in, we need to actually look at ways to actually check that they're true. Um, and we have tools available that we can use to do that. You know, Google Street View for, for things within the UK is a fantastic tool. Um, during the riots, I used that a lot to try and actually cross-reference and check that footage was shot within the town that um, people said it was shot in, where it was, what was the exact location. And then you need to be start looking at, was the weather the same as, say for example, um, we knew it was on that day, is this, is this footage from that day? Trying to speak to the original person who shot it, because ultimately A, you want to try and get their permission to run it, but B, you need to try and find out if it, you know, if it is true or if it's been staged and see if you can get a voice on that. Um, the difficulty comes in, in foreign coverage where we don't have Google Street View. Now, if you're looking at something out of Syria, um, there is a limited amount that we can do to try and work out if that is true. Um, we can still use Google Earth, we can still try and cross-reference a location, maybe look at other videos from that location in the past, try and look at the weather again, weather reports, was that right? Um, but ultimately there comes a point where we've done as much as we can and we just have to run it with, with the caveat that you know, we can't fully verify this information, um, but we've done as much as we can to, to try and do so. Social media is about interacting. You know, it's social for a reason. And part of interacting is actually having some personality. You know, we need to give across personality on our Twitter accounts or on our Facebook pages. But if you're using them as a professional journalist, you've got to remember that what they are is a way for you to broadcast. And ultimately, your online CV. You know, a lot of people who may be following you, maybe future employers, um, and they're watching and, and looking at what you're doing. Now, you need to be aware of the image you're giving across. And it's all about getting a decent blend between personality and um, actual you know, career um, tweets. And that's, that's a very difficult blend to get. But I think once you get it right, then ultimately you can pick up uh, quite a good following and, and a good kind of social following of people who interact with you. And you can still interact with people that you, you may share the same interests outside of journalism, but you just have to be aware of, of limiting those tweets so as not to put off those that follow you for news. And I think it's worth noting that um, of those people who are professional journalists who, who have both, 
the likes of Rory Kepling Jones, he has his Ruskin 147 account and his uh, BBC account. It's actually his, his account, which is a blend of the, the personal and the professional, which, which does much, much better um, than his other one.